Hey, praise the Lord. It is I, Brother Clinton, once again, and you are back on the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as Jesus Christ our Lord commanded. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm glad you're here. I want to talk to you about something that has been brought up to me several times in the past, but more so in the in the recent past, in the last few days. There have many there have been many of you who have brought this up to me and just in the last few days, and that usually lets me know that it's time to pray about something and ask God to reveal it so that I can teach a message about it. And so that's what I've done, and that's what God has done, and so that's why I'm here. Praise the Lord. So uh, we're here to talk about the precept and the law of wearing a, a, a garment that is mixed with linen and woolen. Okay, And it's written in the scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 22, 11, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. That's what I want to talk to you about. Okay, So first of all, I want to address the fact that I, I said to you about a minute or two ago that Many people in time past have written to me about this and asked me about this and presented this precept to me. And the first thing that I want to present to you is very important, and I want to get this out of the way before I go on with the teaching of the message in this video. And that is that most of the people that have written to me about this in time past are not disciples of Jesus Christ. And for those of you who are disciples of Jesus Christ and you've asked me about this, I think that the reason that you asked me about it was because somebody asked you about it, and the person who asked you about it is not a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so that's the first thing that I want to talk to you about. When our Lord Jesus Christ was walking upon the face of the earth, the religious people came to him, and they asked him a question. And the question was relating to, you know, where did you get this power and authority that you're claiming to have to do all these things? And when they asked him this question, Jesus didn't answer them. And he didn't answer them because it was a stupid question. Okay, It was a stupid question. And the Bible tells us to avoid foolish and unlearned questions. And so Jesus, instead of answering the question, he asked them a question. He said, okay, I'll ask you a question. And if you answer me, then I'll answer you. The baptism of John. From whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned among themselves, and you know the story, and they, they decided that they couldn't answer the question. And so Jesus said, well, neither will I tell you by what power I do these things. Because they asked a stupid question, it was obvious by what power he was doing those things. And he refused to answer their question because it was foolish. And he realized that they were not asking their question to learn something. They were asking their question to tempt him, just like it's written in the 19th chapter of Matthew when they came to him asking him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause? And the Bible clearly says that they asked that question to tempt him. Okay, They didn't ask that question because they wanted to know the answer. They asked that question to tempt him, to try to trip him up so that they could catch some word that he said and accuse him of some wrongdoing. And my brothers and sisters, that is the case with most of the people that are going to ask you about this particular precept from the scripture. They're asking you about it not because they, they want to learn about it, in most cases. Not because they want to learn about it, but because their, their wicked friends pointed it out to them. They've never even read the Bible, but their wicked friends pointed it out to them. And so this is a verse of the scripture that they have memorized that they will, you know, whenever somebody comes to them preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and telling them that the, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God and that judgment is coming and that they need to obey the gospel of Christ and walk and live in holiness in order to enter into the kingdom of God and avoid the wrath of God, then these people that hate God, whether they be you know, religious people and denominations or whether they be sodomites or you know, whatever kinds of people that they might be, they're people that hate God and they don't want to hear that. And so they think in their mind that if they present this to you, that they, this verse of the scripture that they learned from their wicked friends, that this will shut you up or shut you down or cause you to speak something that they can take a hold of so that they can accuse you falsely. And so that's normally the reason, largely the reason that people will ask you about this. And for that reason, I need to tell you this. When somebody asks you a question, just the fact that somebody asks you a question does not mean that you have the obligation to answer them, my brothers and sisters. Okay, let's learn from our Lord Jesus Christ. 
whose apostles also said, Foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Strivings about the law are unprofitable and vain. And so we need to avoid those things. And the fact that somebody asks you a question doesn't mean that you have to answer them. Just like I've said many times before, the fact that somebody rings your doorbell doesn't mean that you have to open the door. And the fact that somebody calls you on your phone doesn't mean that you have to stop what you're doing and answer it. You see? And the fact that somebody has asked you a question does not mean that you have an obligation to answer them. So if you perceive that somebody has asked you a question not because they want to learn the truth, but because they just want to tempt you or try to trick you, then you have no obligation to answer a question like that. And it's just that simple. You see, we're not here to win an argument. We're not here to win a debate. And the fools in the denominational churches and the, and the sodomites and the wicked people of this world, they have this concept, this false concept in their minds, that when they have an opinion and somebody else has an opinion that is different, that they have a debate and whoever wins the debate is right. You see, and that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. No such thing is true. Uh, you know, such a thing happened the other, the other day in the United Socialist States of America. They had this thing called the presidential debate. It's part of a show, and it has all the validity of professional wrestling. And um, I didn't watch it, but I have seen a couple of clips from it, uh, like, you know, a little less than one-minute clips. No, actually, not a couple, just one. Uh, where, you know, Donald Trump and Joe Biden were arguing with one another, and one was calling the other one an idiot or whatever. <laughs> And it's just like Looney Tunes. It's, you know, like I said, it has all the validity of professional wrestling. And, and people think that when two men have a debate, that whoever supposedly wins the debate is right. And that's ridiculous. No such thing is true at all. And so, you know, whether you're dealing with a sodomite or, you know, a, a, a wicked person in, in a religious denomination like a Baptist or a Lutheran or a Catholic or whatever, um, they, they, these, especially these theologians, they tend to think that you you have to debate with them and that, because that's what they're used to so that's what they think that you need to do too and they try to draw you into that getting into a debate with them and that's one thing that you want to avoid my brethren because guess what our father's word is not up for debate okay nobody ever invited jesus to a debate and he accepted and he stood in one pulpit and the, and the, and the pharisees in the other pulpit and they said you know they they said their case and then he said his case and jesus never did that the apostles of Jesus Christ never did that. See, that's an invention of men, and it's and it's it's foolish, and it's vain, and it's just a waste of time. There's so many debates on YouTube between different theologians. You know, there's there's lots of videos about you know this guy is a oneness guy and this guy's a trinitarian guy, and they're having a debate, and it's like three hours. And this video is literally like three hours, and these men are wasting three hours, and all the people in the audience are wasting three hours listening to these lost and confused men while souls are perishing, including their own. You see, and, and they're, they're striving to win this debate, and for nothing, because they're both in error. Okay, if, they, if either one of them believed the word of God, they wouldn't be standing there wasting three hours having a debate. Because the Bible says a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So how, how long does it take to give a man one or two admonitions? Well, it doesn't take three hours. <laughs> I know that. It doesn't take three hours. So, you know, if you admonish a man once or twice from the word of God and it's evident that he's not hearing the word of God, then he's a heretic and, and he's subverted and, 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 and he's a sinner. He's condemned, he's condemned of himself because there's something that's keeping him from believing the word of God, whether it's his pride or his love of his own self or, or whatever the case may be, or maybe he's an idolater or maybe you know, whatever the case may be. There's, there's lots of different reasons. But um, basically, you know, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first point that I needed to make and drive home to you in this particular video. And, and I needed to set this out there first because there's probably people that clicked on this video because of the title wanting to see what Brother Clinton's going to say so that they can take hold of something and falsely accuse him or whatever. And if that's why you came here, I'm sorry that you wasted your time and you might as well just go on your way and find some other entertainment videos to watch because this is a Christian ministry. And the purpose for this video is not to have a debate or to argue with fools about the law and to have contentions and strivings about the law. People who think that God's law is unjust or unfair or whatever, um, they can just go somewhere else and find something else to do because they're, they're not going to have an audience here in the comment forum or with me. 
um, because people who think that they that they can you know judge God's law, um, they're going to have to take that up with Him. Okay, not with me. It's not my word. I didn't make it up. Um, I'm just a, a messenger. Praise the Lord. God's law is righteous and true. It's not righteous and true because I say it is. It's righteous and true because He says it is. And anybody who has a problem with that, they can take it up with Him. Period. End of story. Praise the Lord. So, having said that. Uh, please open up your Bibles with me, your Holy Bible, King James Version, to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And while you're doing that, I want to share with you Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11, which says, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts, as of woolen and linen together. Okay, And also, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 19, says, Ye shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a, with a diverse kind, Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed, neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. Okay, And also, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, there's more to it than verse 11. I read verse 11 for you, but I want to read verses 9 through 11. It says, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together, We've read that in the New Testament, haven't we? And then it says, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts, as of woolen and linen together. So, beside the fact that God said, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts, as of woolen and linen together, we can see from reading the context of this passage that there's a little bit more to it than that. It's not just about a, a, a garment that is that contains linen and woolen woven together. And that's what it's about, by the way. It's not about wearing a woolen garment and a linen garment at the same time. And this is an important point to bring forth. It is about wearing a garment of diverse sorts. A garment, one garment of diverse sorts, as of woolen and linen together. That's how it says it in Deuteronomy. And in Leviticus, it says, Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. So this is not talking about wearing two garments that are of different materials at the same time. This is talking about wearing one garment that has linen and woolen threads woven together in the same garment. Okay, That's what God was talking about. And he put it in the context in his law with other things like letting your cattle gender with a diverse kind and sowing your field with mingled seed and plowing with an ox and an ass together. And, you know, it reminds me of the old Sesame Street episodes, you know, which of these things is not like the other. It's, it's, um, <laughs> thank you for those of you who remember that. Um, so I'm so I don't feel too old all by myself. But anyway, and those of you who are young, you millennials, you're you're like, what is he talking about? Never mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, um, these things all have something in common, and and that that which they have in common is separation. Okay, it's not right or good to gender cattle with a diverse kind. Okay, cattle should be when you have your cattle, if you're a, a cattle farmer. You should have your cattle breeding with other cattle of the same kind. It's not good to, you know, put dogs and cats together and, you know, giraffes and sheep together and lions and tigers together and breed them together. That's not correct. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way that God has intended it to be. God has intended that everything should bring forth fruit after his own kind. Okay? Everything was created with the seed in itself. Every living thing was created with the seed in itself that brings forth after its own kind on purpose. So we're, we're not supposed to be mixing species together. And I know that there are men who are doing that, and it's a very stupid and dangerous thing to do. Um, so, And he says, Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed, neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. So there are some definite reasons why God has said that his people should not do that. And that's what I want to share with you starting in Deuteronomy chapter 7. So let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And I want to share with you from verses 1 through 6. And may God bless the reading of his word. So it is written, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it. Okay, now what's going on here? Deuteronomy is, the title of Deuteronomy means the second reading of the law. Okay, when, what we're reading here is what Moses spoke to the people of Israel after they had been in the wilderness for almost 40 years, just two months short of 40 years. 
They were in the last two months of their 40-year journey in the wilderness. So Moses had already repeated all these things to them. Well, repeated, no. Moses had already spoken all these things to them in time past, but it had been several years. And so when the time came that it was two months away, the, the children of Israel were two months away from entering into the promised land after they had been in the wilderness for 40 years, God ordained that Moses should read all the law to the people of Israel again so that they could hear it, so they could be fresh in their minds, and so that the young ones who hadn't heard it before could hear it. That's what Deuteronomy is. The whole book of Deuteronomy is what Moses spoke to the children of Israel during the last two months of their time traveling through the, through the wilderness when they were on their way to the promised land. Okay, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, okay, a nation of people that he raised up from Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and they went down into Egypt for 400 years, and then God pulled them out of Egypt, delivered them out of Egypt with a high and mighty hand uh, by the hand of Moses, and then they were in the wilderness for 40 years, knowing that they were going to enter into the promised land after the ones that were disobedient among them perished in the wilderness. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Now, why is God telling him this? Because when God spoke to Abraham a little over 400 years earlier, he told Abraham that he would give that land that he stood upon unto him and to his seed forever. But the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. And so God sent his people. Got, you know, Abraham begat Isaac and Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat 12 sons and a daughter. And his 12 sons were called the 12 tribes of Israel. And all the children that came from them were the tribes of Israel. And then God rose up Joseph in the house of Pharaoh, Joseph who was sold by his brethren into slavery. God raised up Joseph, who was the, who was the son of Israel, in the house of Pharaoh. There was a great famine in the land, and then God sent Israel into Egypt. Okay, Joseph was the second in charge under Pharaoh, and, and, in, and in Egypt there was corn. And so the family of Israel, being 75 souls, went down into Egypt and then, and Joseph took care of them there. And then after that, Pharaoh died and another Pharaoh rose up that didn't know Joseph and didn't regard God. Then he mistreated the people of Israel, but they continued to multiply and grow until they were a great nation. And then they came out of Egypt by the hand of God when God sent Moses to bring them out of Egypt. And they came through the wilderness and they were going into this land that God had promised Abraham over 400 years beforehand. But God said to Abraham at that time that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. Okay, But at this time, when what we're reading in Deuteronomy chapter 7, the iniquity of the Amorites was full. God had had enough. He had had it about up to here. Has any of your mothers ever said, I've had it about up to here? Well, God had had it about up to here with the Amorites, with the people that lived in the land that was called Canaan at that time. Now the land is called Israel. Okay, So he says, When the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, I'm reading from verse 2, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. God raised up his people Israel and sanctified them and sent them forth to destroy the sinners in the land of Canaan. So he says, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Okay, God warned them about this. And this happened. We know about the doctrine of Balaam, those of us who are raised up in the doctrine of Christ. We know about the doctrine of Balaam, how that Balaam used a certain counsel to give to Balak, the king of Moab, in order to deceive the children of Israel and to weaken them so that they wouldn't be a threat to Moab anymore. 
And the way that he did that was by introducing the women of Moab into the tribes of Israel, little by little, until finally the children of Israel took the women of Moab unto themselves, and then they soon after began to start sacrificing unto the gods of the Moabites, Chemosh and, and Molech, the abominations of the Moabites. And that was called the, the matter of Baal Peor, and God slew, I think, 25,000 people in Israel at that particular time because his wrath was kindled against them because they started worshiping the gods of the Canaanites. And the reason they started worshiping the gods of the Canaanites was because they started taking the daughters of the Canaanites unto themselves and they started weaving the fabric of the Canaanites in with the fabric of the people of Israel, making one garment out of two different kinds of thread. Let's read verse 3 again. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Praise the Lord. For those of you who are not familiar with this ministry, there is a video on this channel called Who is Israel? And I would highly recommend that you take the time to watch that video. It'll take you a while. I think it's somewhere around an hour, 40, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, something like that. Um, but it, it's the, the title of the video is, Who is Israel? And the premise of the video is that Israel is Jesus Christ. And those who are in Jesus Christ are the Israel of God. Okay, And I'm not talking about replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel. That's a theological myth, and it's, it's very confusing, and it's also a lie. And that's not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm talking about is that Israel has always been the chosen people of God. Okay, And it is not the physical seed of Abraham, although God did choose Abraham and God did make a promise to Abraham and God will fulfill that promise to Abraham by saving a remnant of the people of Israel, the physical seed of Abraham, and bringing them into the land that God promised to Abraham. That's going to happen. But at the same time, God hath said to his people Israel, because you all have provoked me to jealousy with gods that are no gods, then I'm going to provoke you to jealousy with a people that is not a people and I'm going to call them my people. They that were not my people, shall call. I shall call them my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. And so God has chosen out of the world Gentiles. He made his servant, Jesus Christ, Israel, a light to the Gentiles. See, it's written in the 49th chapter of Isaiah, I believe, so that the people of the Gentiles would come, and people of the Gentiles that God had chosen before the foundation of the world would believe on his word and come into the into the into that into that olive tree, be grafted into that olive tree, as Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 11, to be grafted into that olive tree, okay? And also, those branches, that the natural branches that were broken off because of unbelief, God is also able to graft them in again as well. So this is what's, what's going on, what's been going on since the beginning of the world, and what God is doing right now. Jesus Christ is Israel. He is Israel. He is the descendant of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. This is the very first verse of the Gospel of Matthew, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus Christ is Israel. The son of God, Jesus Christ, is Israel. He is the prince of God. He is the fulfillment of the, the, the wrestling that Jacob did with that angel, which was the angel of the Lord in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. And, and the day was breaking, and the angel said, the day is breaking, let me go. And Jacob said, uh-uh, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And the angel blessed him and called his name Israel, which means a prince of God, or one who has power with God. You see? And so Israel, he begat sons and daughters. But it isn't the physical seed of Israel that is Israel. Even as Paul the Apostle said, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And the Pharisees, they said, we be not born of fornication, we are Abraham's seed. And Jesus said, if you were the seed of Abraham, then you would do after the works of Abraham. Right? But now... <laughs> they were trying to kill Jesus Christ. 
that wasn't the works of Abraham. That's the work of the devil, because the devil was a murderer from the beginning. He said, Ye are of your father the devil. If you were Abraham's children, you would love me. You see? But ye are, your, your, ye are of your father the devil, for the devil was a murderer from the beginning. So these were the Jews. Yes, they were the physical seed of Abraham, but Jesus said that they were of their father the devil because they were of a different seed, spiritually speaking. They were of that seed of Cain, that wicked one. Praise the Lord. So there are two seeds. There are two seeds. There is the seed of Jesus Christ, and then there is the seed of the devil. There are those, there, there, there's only two kinds of people in this world. There are the children of Jesus Christ, and there are the children of the devil. And there are two seeds. And those two seeds have been planted together until the time of the harvest. Remember the parable of the sower and the parables that Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 13 and the, and the, and the parable of the tares. Let's go there. Let's go there. Praise God. Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay. Another parable. I'm in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, Pardon me if I'm speaking too fast. Whew. Matthew 13, 24. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. This is why God commanded the children of Israel not to sow diverse kinds of seeds in their, in their, in their furrows. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up the wheat also with them. Pardon me, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Okay, let both grow together until the harvest. It wasn't the master's will that these seeds should be planted together. But being that they already were planted together and the tares had begun to spring up, he didn't say tear them all down. He said, let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, now let's go to the latter part of the chapter where he gives them the interpretation of this parable. Oh, praise the Lord. So in verse 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Two seeds. Two seeds growing up together interwoven together but contrary to the law of God because an enemy hath done this he that hath an ear to hear let him hear the field is the world the good seed are the children of the kingdom but the tares are the children of the wicked one the enemy that sowed them is the devil the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire so shall it be in the end of this world the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. Okay, I want to stop at that word offend for a minute. The English word offend can be used in two different ways. It can be used in the way of, uh, to mean something said that makes you feel bad. You know, if I make a joke about your mother being fat or something like that. I'm sorry if your mother's fat. I shouldn't have said that. But I mean, if I say something like, you know, your mother's so fat when she sits around the house, she sits around the house. Okay. And if your mother's fat, that's going to be an, an offense to you. That will offend you. Okay. But that's not what this is talking about. That's not the way that the English word offend is being used here. The English word offend can also mean to cause somebody to stumble. To cause somebody to stumble. Okay. If you're walking down the street 
and you know you're looking up in the air and I say hey he's looking up in the air I could trip him and so I just stick out my foot and trip you I have uh, I have caused you to offend I've tripped you I've caused you to offend I've caused you to stumble and fall down that's what this means okay the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that cause people to stumble and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear let him hear let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7 so praise the Lord this is what this is the, the, the this is the reason for the commandment that God gave to his people Israel not to intermarry among the tribes of the Canaanites this is the reason that God gave his people Israel the commandment to not put on a, a, a garment mingled of linen and woolen, okay? A, a, a garment of diverse sorts, of, as of woolen and linen together. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, 11, I have this open right in front of me on my screen here. It's worded very in a very, very interesting way, and I'm not going to do any play on words or anything. I'm just reading the Bible as it's written. It says, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together as of okay this is a very important little phrase here deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 11 thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together okay as of this doesn't mean that the only thing that god was commanding his people to abstain from was wool and linen come with me to first corinthians chapter 5 praise the lord thank you jesus i love you lord i thank thee for thy holy spirit hallelujah 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Hallelujah. I believe it's in chapter 5. Uh-huh. Hallelujah. No, pardon me, just for a moment. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, yes, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So let's let's start in verse 9 and read through verse 11. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Okay, so if we're not to company with fornicators, then we are to separate ourselves from them, right? I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, said Paul, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you, and this is the part where I want you to pay attention, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. Now listen. With such an one not to eat. With such an one. Now what does this mean? It means that anybody who is like this, we are not to sit down and eat with them. A, anyone who calls himself a brother and, and is like this, this doesn't mean that only these sins are what Paul's talking about. Pardon me, I said that wrong. Let me say it again. This doesn't mean that these particular sins are the only ones that Paul is talking about. These are just some examples of this type of sinful behavior. And so therefore he says, with such an one, no not to eat. Okay? So what if a person is... Um, He's a he, he's called a brother and he he um, um, okay <laughs> let me just think of an example he's called a brother but yet the sodomites were having a march in the street and and marching for their right to you know for men to marry other men and he was down there holding a sign saying men have the right to marry other men okay is this man could this man be called a fornicator because of that no could he be called covetous because of that. No. Could he be called an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner because he was holding a sign in a sodomite rally? No. But see, if he was holding a sign in a sodomite rally fighting for the rights of sodomites to pretend that they're married to each other, then he is such an one. He is among that group. He is one of those people that if he calls himself a brother, we're not to sit down and eat with that man. He needs to understand that he needs to turn from his sins and, and, and be holy in the sight of God in order for us to fellowship together because we can't fellowship unless we're fellows. 
See, we can't have communion unless we're common to each other. And so that is exactly what the, 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 what was written in the law by the hand of Moses when God said, As of, thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. It isn't that there's any poisonous combination of woolen and linen if they're woven together in the same garment. It's like they're, they're, they're as if they were going to poison you or something. That's not it. It doesn't matter if it's woolen and linen or if it's woolen and something else. What God was teaching his people by this commandment is that when you make a garment, make that garment out of one thing. Don't make it out of two different threads that are different from each other, woven together. That's what the message is in Deuteronomy 22.11 and, and Leviticus 19.19. Okay? It's not that it's dangerous to our health to wear a garment that is you know, mixed of woolen and linen together. It's not that there's any other thing about it, at least not that I know of, that is sinful or dis undesirable in the eyes of God. The thing that is undesirable in the eyes of God is when two threads that are different from one another become interwoven together into one. That's what this teaching is. Praise the Lord. Come with me to Ezra chapter 4, the book of Ezra. Now Ezra... For those of you who are not that familiar with the scripture, was a priest among the people of Israel who was with the captives when they were in captivity in Babylon. The people of Judah and Israel disobeyed God, disobeyed God, disobeyed God, until he finally sent them into captivity to Babylon. And before that happened, and I just want to take a couple of minutes to explain this because I believe it's necessary to understand the, the passage that we're about to read. Ezra chapter 4, by the way. <coughs> Jeremiah preached to the people of Israel, the people of Judah and, and, and Judea, um, the, which was in the southern kingdom. Let me back up a little bit. David was the king of Israel. Okay, First rose up Saul. Saul disobeyed God. And then David was the king of Israel. David begat a son whose name was Solomon. And because David sinned against the Lord in the matter of Bathsheba, who was the mother of Solomon, then God said that David would not die for his sin, but that after his death, the kingdom would be divided. And so it was that after Solomon reigned, Solomon had a son named Rehoboam. And at the same time, one of Solomon's servants named Jeroboam, um, who had fled into Egypt at the time, came back and was anointed king over the people of Israel in the northern part of Israel. So Rehoboam was the, was the son of Solomon, and he was the king in Judah, which is in the southern part of the country of Israel. And in the northern part of the country of Israel, whose capital is Samaria, they anointed Jeroboam to reign over Israel. And that's when the kingdom was divided, when the son of Solomon began to reign. That's when the kingdom was divided, and then it was called Judah and Israel, all throughout the scripture. Or sometimes it was called Judah and Ephraim, all throughout the scripture, throughout the Old Testament. After the death of Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was divided. And so the kings of Israel were wicked exceedingly. When I say Israel, I'm talking about the northern kingdom that was called Israel. Pardon me. Um, and the bottom part, the southern part was called Judah, and the northern part was called Israel, or sometimes it was called Ephraim. And Ephraim after the son of Manasseh. Um, and Manasseh had two sons. Eph no, pardon me. Jo after the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He had these sons in Egypt. Okay, and... I won't go into detail about that anyway. We have the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was called Israel, or sometimes they were called Ephraim, and they were wicked exceedingly. And the first thing that they did when they departed uh, and, and separated themselves was that Jeroboam, who became later as a standard of badness for all the kings of Israel to be measured against, uh, made two golden calves after the manner of Egypt. And he put one in Bethel and one in Dan. And he told the people that it's too far for you to go down to Jerusalem on the feasts of the Lord because the Lord had commanded all males in Israel three times in the year they were to come to Jerusalem for the feast. But Jeroboam said uh, in his heart, well, if they go down to Jerusalem for the feast uh, of the Lord, then their hearts will turn away from me and they'll turn to Jeroboam and they'll kill me. Pardon me, they'll turn to Rehoboam and they'll kill me. So he devised this plan in his heart, and he made two golden calves after the manner of Egypt, and he put one in Bethel, which is in the southern part of the, you know, of the northern part. Here's the northern part of Israel. Here's Bethel, and here's Dan. Okay, 
one in the south and one in the north. And he told the people of the kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, it's too far to you to go down to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. So I've made for you the gods that delivered you out of the land of Egypt, and you can worship the gods here. And so he became a standard of badness for all those after him. And so Israel just began to go more and more and more into sin. And finally, the king of Assyria came and took them captive into Assyria and sent the people of Assyria into the land of Israel to dwell on the land so that the land would be kept, so that there would be people there to till the, to till the soil so that the land wouldn't you know, become overgrown. Um, and so the king of Assyria took the people of Israel into his land, captive into his land, and he took his own people of Assyria and put them into the land of Israel. Okay, you can read this in the books of the Kings and Chronicles. And so when that happened, there was a mix of the people. That's where the Samaritans came from. Okay, they were a mixed breed of the people of, between the people of Israel and the people of Assyria. Okay, this happened about 135 years before Nebuchadnezzar came and uh, took captive Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, the people of Judah saw that their brethren in the northern parts of Israel were taken captive into Assyria because of their sin, and Ezekiel was commanded to prophesy about this to the people of Israel, and I think it's the 16th chapter of Ezekiel, maybe it's the 23rd chapter, forgive me, I don't remember, it's either the 16th or the 23rd chapter, about the two women, um, Ahola and Aholiba, and they were, they were um, Jerusalem and, and Samaria, and so Judah, seeing that her sister, Israel, was taken into captivity for her wickedness, didn't repent from her sin, but just, just continued to sin more and more until Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came and took the people of Israel, the, the southern kingdom, Judah and Jerusalem, captive into Babylon. Okay, this is terrible. The glory of Israel had departed. God had given totally all of Israel into the hands of their enemies. He had given the northern kingdom into the hand of the king of Assyria. And then about 135 years later, he gave the southern kingdom into captivity into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And so the people of Israel were in Babylon, the ones that survived Nebuchadnezzar's overthrow, were in Babylon for 70 years until all that generation died and a new generation was raised up. And among that generation of people was Ezra, a priest. And he came out after the, the decree of the king of, um, of the, the, the Medes and the Persians because they were reigning after the Babylonians. <clears throat> God raised up Cyrus and Cyrus made a decree and sent Ezra, the priest with some of the Jews to Jerusalem to go and build the temple. And that's what's going on in the book of Ezra. That's what the book of Ezra is all about. In case you weren't familiar with that, that's what's going on in the book of Ezra. So, whew. <laughs> in Ezra chapter 4, it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, let us build with you. For we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esar Haddon, king of Ashur, which brought us up hither. Okay, what is this talking about? Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, the adversaries, why were they the adversaries? Because they were a people that were mixed breed. Not only, I'm not talking about in the flesh, I'm talking about spiritually now because these people were people of Israel that had gone into captivity in Assyria and the king of Assyria had sent his people down into Israel so that the people had become mixed and it's not a thing about skin color or race it's a thing about what God said in Deuteronomy chapter 7 when you mingle yourself with the people of these other lands then their women will teach you to go after their gods and then my wrath will be kindled against you that's the point it's not that God has anything against people of different skin colors marrying each other. It's that God has something against his people mixing ourselves, being woven together with other people that worship other gods that are no gods. That's the point. And so these people, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, were those that were living in the land of Israel, but yet they had corrupted, or they had been corrupted, by the mixing of the people of Israel and the people of Assyria. And so 
it wasn't because of the color of their skin or because of a racial thing physically. It was because of the fact that they had adopted the ways of the Assyrians and assimilated those things into the way that they worshipped God. You see, these were the people of Israel, the, the, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. These are the people of Israel. You see, just like the people in the churches today profess to be Christians, but they worship Babylonian deities, and they have they have Egyptian traditions in their churches, and they don't realize it. They think that they're worshiping God. You see? But they have the Christ Mass Festival, where they have this Christ Mass tree with a pentagram on top on the 25th of December, worshiping Saturn, because it's the Saturnalia Festival. And they have the Ishtar Festival that they imagine is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it's not. It's about Ishtar, Ashtoreth, Semiramis, the goddess of fertility, the queen of heaven. That's what the, the Ishtar Festival is about, that people call Easter. And so they have all these pagan traditions of the Egyptians and the Babylonians in their churches, which is why they have a steeple on top, which is a phallus. Okay, it's a phallic symbol. It's a symbol to the fallen angels that that's their property, those fornication centers. And they have pastors and teachers that are graduated from seminaries, which were raised up by the Jesuits of Rome for the specific purpose of deceiving people and injecting all these traditions and doctrines from Egypt and Babylon into the churches. And so that the people are having their fornication meetings, thinking that they're going to church and worshiping God, but what they're really doing is learning the ways of the heathen. And they're calling it after names from the Bible. You see, those people in the churches today that you know go to their Hillsong concerts and sit in front of Rick Warren and you know, and Joel Osteen and Kenneth Copeland and all those people, and they think that everybody's a Christian who accepts Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and who are we to judge? If somebody says he's a Christian, how can we know? God's only the judge. We can't judge if anybody's a Christian or not, say they. You see, but those of us who are in Jesus Christ, we know the difference between someone who is a child of God and someone who is not a child of God. Just like Jesus knew the difference between the Jews and the sons of the devil. He said, ye are of your father the devil, for the works of your father are, are murderers from the beginning. Ye do the works of your father, for he was a murderer from the beginning. You see, Jesus knew the difference between the Jews and the children of the devil. True Jews are those which are circumcised in the heart whose praise is not of men, but of God. And we know that someone who is born of the incorruptible seed of the word of God is one who speaks as the oracles of God and lives according to the word of God. He that saith, I know him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Speaking of Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, they are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You see, it is given unto us to know who our brethren are and who our brethren are not. And if somebody comes up to us and says that they're a Christian, we can tell by using the, the sword that God has put in our hands, the word of God, or I should say the sword that God has put in our mouths, we can tell by using the sword that God has put in our mouths after talking to them for a couple of minutes whether or not they are truly our brethren. You see, because the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder between the joints and the marrow and the soul and the spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You see, religious people come to us and they say, well, who are you to judge me? You don't know my heart. And I love saying to them, when it's appropriate. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. All that's necessary to know what's in your heart is to listen to you speak for a couple of minutes, and everything that's in your heart is going to come right out of your mouth, right in front of me. You see, as in water, face answereth, face answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it is given to us to know who our brethren are and who our brethren are not. And we are commanded to separate ourselves from those that are not our brethren. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's continue in Ezra chapter 4. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, okay, 
When the people in the various denominations heard that there were some of us who were gathering together in the name of the Lord, and we're preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ, and we're living according to the commandments of our God, and obeying Jesus Christ our Lord and walking in holiness. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then came, pardon me, then they came, pardon me just for a moment, cold water is our friend, Praise the Lord. <clears throat> then they came to Zerubbabel. Okay, Zerubbabel is a name that means a stranger in Babylon. And Zerubbabel was the prince, one of the princes of the children of Israel that came with Ezra, who was ordained of God to come with them, children of the captivity, going back to the land of Israel to build the house of God. And these other people who were Israelites as well, but they were mixed with the Assyrians. They were a mixed breed. Okay, And we're not talking about their flesh. We're talking about the religion. We're talking about the fact that they've learned the ways of the Assyrians. They learned the ways of the heathen, but they're still the people of Israel. And they, they think that they're Israelites because they're physically related, at least half physically related now, to Jacob, just as the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Okay, They still are related to the people of Israel, but yet they have been corrupted by the doctrines of of the Assyrians by the practices the pagan idolatry of the Assyrians but they're still Israel and they still think that they worship the God of Israel but they're worshiping the God of Israel according to the edicts and the statutes of the Assyrians just like the people in the churches today think to worship God by the edicts and the statutes of Rome who has taught them idolatry and wickedness and called it after names from the Bible and they don't know the difference this is what's going on here. Please pay attention, my brothers and my sisters. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Okay, these people that were in Israel, of Israel physically, but they were pagans because they had learned paganism when they were sent into captivity. They said unto them, let us build with you. Let us build with you. For we seek your God as ye do. For we seek your God as ye do. You see, they thought that they were serving the same God. But they were not serving the same God because God is not worshipped just any old way. God is worshipped in spirit and in truth. God is worshipped in the beauty of holiness. God is worshipped in the way that he has commanded and not in any other way. He will not accept strange fire. He, they said, For we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Ashur, which is Assyria, which brought us up hither. You see, the king of Assyria sent them into the land of Israel in time past and they mixed with the seed of Israel and these are the children of those people that are coming to to uh, to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and they're like yeah we're we're part of Israel too and we want to worship we want to build this temple with you what would have happened if Zerubbabel and the and the chief of the fathers of Israel would have said okay come and build with us <clears throat> What would have happened? They would have been making a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Two different threads being woven into the same garment. That's not right. And that's what God has commanded his people Israel not to do and, he, and what he has commanded us not to do. And it doesn't pertain to something that you can put on your body because, <clears throat> pardon me, because even as the Lord Jesus Christ said, that which cometh out of the pardon me, that which goeth into a man's mouth cannot defile him. It is what comes out of his mouth that defiles the man. Okay? Eating pork is not good for you. It's 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 a, it's a scavenger animal. Pigs eat garbage. Okay? And so therefore eating pigs is not good for you. That's why God commanded in the law that his people should abstain from eating pork. However, eating pork isn't going to defile you. It can't defile you. Even Jesus said to the people of Israel during the time of the Old Testament when he came to fulfill the law, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, 
but that which cometh out of the mouth, that defileth a man. See, eating pork is not good for you, and it can make you sick. Okay, I don't like it. I, I eat it sometimes when I want to, but there's no commandment that I am not allowed to eat it. And Jesus said to the people of Israel during the time of the Old Testament that there is nothing that enters into their mouth that can defile them, including pork and catfish, or whatever the case may be, shrimp and lobster. Okay, It's not good to eat those things. They're scavengers. They eat garbage. That's what they're for. They're for cleaning up the garbage on the bottom of the food chain. That's why God set them as an example for his people Israel not to eat them and also to make them a separated people so that when they would go into this land, the other people would see that the people of Israel were not like them. They were a holy people unto the Lord their God. And so it is that wearing a, a certain garment, I don't know what this shirt is made of, and I don't care, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because what is important is that we do not take two threads that are different and weave them into the same garment. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. And so back to Ezra chapter 4, verse 3, it says, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua, which is Joshua, which is the name of our Savior, okay, I shouldn't say Joshua, I should have said Joshua, as it's written in English, like the book of Joshua, okay? Joshua is how this word is translated directly from Hebrew into English. But it's Yeshua, which is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Okay, come on and build with us. Great. Let's all just have, be under one big umbrella, under Rome. Let's have ecumenism. Let's all have an ecumenical party, whether you're Lutheran or Catholic or Baptist or Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or whatever. We all believe in God. Let's just put our Bibles aside and just love God and love each other. Let's just all gather around the campfire and sing Kumbaya. Wait a minute. No, that's not actually what Zerubbabel and Jeshua said. It says, But Zerubbabel and Yeshua the, and, and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God. Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Praise the Lord. And it goes. the scripture goes on to say how these people continued to be adversaries against them and even complained to the king about them until the king shut down the, the work. Uh, temporarily, of course. But this is the reason that God said in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11, Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Okay? It's not about the kind of clothes that you wear. It's not about that. It was never about that. Just like circumcision was never about um, the, the foreskin of a man's flesh. It was about the circumcision of the heart. See, yes, God did command the people of Israel to circumcise the foreskin of their flesh. But that was what the Bible calls a type or a shadow. Something that was showing something good to come. Better things to come. Shadows of good things to come. And holy convocation. That's what the Sabbath day is. The seventh day Sabbath. And all the, the feasts of the people of Israel. The feasts of Israel that God gave, pardon me, the feasts of the Lord that he gave to the people of Israel. The seven feasts that he gave to the people of Israel. And also the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 23 that these are holy convocations. They were given to the people of Israel so that they would do them as a carnal ordinance or a carnal commandment in order to show forth something that God was going to do in the future. That's what a holy convocation is. It's a rehearsal. It's something that the people of Israel did to show forth something that God was going to do in the future. Even though they didn't realize that, they just did it because God told them to do it. See? So when they were commanded not to wear a garment of diverse sorts, as of woolen and linen together, or whatever the two things may be, not to mix two different kinds of thread, weave them together into the same garment. That's perversion. That's perversion. Okay, It's not about the shirt. It's not about the robe. It's about the principle of taking two different threads that are two different material and weaving them together into one garment. Praise the Lord. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. For those of you who know the scripture, you already know exactly where I'm going. Praise God. 
Let's begin in verse 14. Okay, and when we do this, where was it? Deuteronomy chapter Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. It says, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. And remember when I read that in the beginning of this message, I said, we've heard that in the New Testament, haven't we? Praise the Lord. This is that place. So 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. A yoke is a, is a wooden device that connects two animals together to double the plowing power of animals. Animals are used to pull a plow in order to till the ground. Okay, And instead of using just one animal, it's better to use two animals. But they have to be two animals that are the same size, two animals that are the same kind, the same shape. Okay, An ox and an ass together, that's not going to work. When you put a yoke on an ox and an ass together, it's going to be crooked and they're not going to be able to pull the plow properly. You're probably going to break the plow because they're not the same. They're not the same shape. They're totally different animals. Say, okay, except for the fact that they're mammals. Other than that, there's really no similarity between them. And so you can't take an ox and an ass and yoke them together to pull a plow because it's not going to work. Why did God say that? Because it was an abomination to put a yoke on an ox and an ass together? Would God have, have hated or would that have defiled the people if they had put an ox and an ass in the same yoke together? Would that have been a sin? No, it wouldn't have been a sin. It, would, it just would have been a stupid thing that wouldn't have worked out. And it would have been a life lesson for them concerning the things that we just read in, in, in Ezra chapter 4 and what we're about to read here in the New Testament as well. The same thing. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What is an unbeliever? An unbeliever is someone who is not in the doctrine of Christ. It doesn't matter if they profess to be a Christian or not. There's, lots, there's tons of unbelievers in the churches. Most of the people, the vast majority of people that call themselves Christians are unbelievers. You know, I was just dealing with, with one recently, and he just wrote to me the other day, and I won't mention who this person is, but someone who I've mentioned in time past, I've had discussions with him in time past about the fact that Christians don't take up guns to kill people in our own defense. And he wouldn't listen, and he wouldn't listen, until finally I just had to let him go, I had to turn him over, and a terrible thing happened to him, which is very terrible, and it makes me feel very, very sad. But that's what happens when we disobey God. See, and I can't walk together with a man that doesn't believe the word of God. A man that believes that he needs to carry a gun to defend himself is an unbeliever. He doesn't believe the word of God. See, because the Bible says, recompense no man evil for evil. All that take the sword shall perish with the sword. If any man smites you on your one, one cheek, turn to him the other also. If a man t sues you at the law for your coat, give him your cloak also. See? So a man that doesn't believe the word of God, I can't walk with him. A man that I've spoken to who is, is, is married to another man's wife. You know, he's, he's, he's in love with somebody else's wife. He's married to her. She's divorced from her first husband. And, and now he's married to her. And they think that they're both Christians. And they think that God has, has accepted their second marriage. They think that God has forgiven this woman of her first marriage. As if a marriage is a sin to be forgiven. And they think that they're blessed, and their pastor tells them that, that they're blessed. Their lying pastor, with a false New Age Bible in his hand, has assured them that they are blessed, when in fact they're living in open adultery before God and men. See, that man and I can't walk together, because we're, he's an unbeliever. He doesn't believe the word of God. You see, a man that doesn't believe that you speak with tongues when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, he's an unbeliever. A man that thinks that he is saved from his sins by accepting Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior and then he just gets baptized afterwards as an outward profession of an inward change. He's an unbeliever. Okay? A man who celebrates the Christ Mass Festival and yet calls himself a Christian and goes to church, he's an unbeliever. These are unbelievers. A man that believes that God is a trinity of persons and that Jesus Christ is one-third of the Godhead a separate God from God the Father called God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who was supposedly there with God from the beginning and helped God create everything. 
because he's a co-equal God and a co-eternal God, a man that believes things like that is an unbeliever. Okay, he's, he's the same as those Samaritans that were brought down by the king of Assyria into Israel and professed to be Israelites, and they were physically, but they were, because they were related to the Israelites through marriage, but they were learned in the, in the pagan traditions of the Assyrians. They were unbelievers. And Zerubbabel and the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, You all have nothing to do with us to build the house. We're going to build the house by ourselves. Because God is with us and we keep his word. You see? This is why God commanded not to mingle two different types of material woven into the same material. This is why. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, let's continue. Be, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Amen? And remember we talked about fellowship earlier? I said you can't have fellowship unless we're fellows. You and I, we cannot have fellowship unless we're fellows. If we're not fellows, then we can't have any fellowship. See, fellows means that we are of the same mind, that we're headed in the same direction, that we have the same purpose in life. We're fellows. See, and if we're not fellows, then we can't have fellowship. There can be no fellowship if we're not fellows. And there can be no communion if we're not common to each other. See? So Paul says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Where did he get that from? Why did he use the word yoked? He got it from Deuteronomy 22.10. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. It isn't because it, was, it would be a sin against God to put two animals on the same yoke. It is a lesson from God to teach the people that they were to not intermarry with the Canaanites and take daughters of the Canaanites and give their sons, or pardon me, give their daughters to the Canaanite sons so that the two cultures would become united or mixed together and the, and the, and the, and the paganism and the idolatry of the Canaanites would infiltrate the people of Israel. And so it is with us in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not to plow with an ox and an ass together. We are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. I, as a Christian, cannot go to a Lutheran church and sit down with Lutherans as if we're all Christians together and worship God. I'm not just picking on Lutherans. It's just one that I picked right now, okay? Okay, I picked it, but I'm not picking on them. hope that makes sense. But this could be said of any denomination, okay? A Baptist, a Methodist, an Episcopal, a Catholic, a, a, a Pentecostal, an Apostolic, um, a Jehovah's Witness, whatever the case may be. I, as a Christian, cannot go into a meeting of these people and sit down as if we were all Christians and worship God together. Because they're not worshiping the same God that I'm worshiping. They think that they are, and they call their gods by the same names, and they call their things by names from the Bible, but they're not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So the only reason that I should ever be among them in their midst is to be preaching the word of God to them and teaching them to turn from their evil ways and learn to, to worship God in spirit and in truth. And if they're not willing to receive that, then I must come out from among them if I want to please God. You see, I am saved from my sins by the grace of God because I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and was baptized in his name for the remission of my sins and have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, which caused me to speak with tongues and prophesy. Now, how am I going to sit with a man who believes that because he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, that's when he got saved? And he believes that baptism is an outward showing of an inward sign, something that you do after you're saved, just to show your, 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 a public declaration of your faith in Christ. And he believes that he has the Holy Spirit, even though he doesn't, because his pastor told him as soon as he believed on Jesus Christ, he automatically had the Holy Spirit. So this man is not born of water or of the Spirit. And Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So how am I going to sit with this man and call him brother and shake his hand and pray together with him and go out witnessing together with him when he's preaching different gods and a different gospel than I am. How does that work? That's putting an ox and an ass in the same yoke. It doesn't work. 
That's the answer to the question. When I say, how is that going to work? The answer is it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because we are to be of the same mind and of the same judgment. We are to be with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Period. God said that. It's not my word. If you're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, then you don't have God. And if you don't have God and I do, it's not that I'm better than you because I'm not. Because it's by the grace of God that I'm saved through faith. And even that faith is not of myself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But if you are not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, and I am, then we can't walk together. You see, one of two things is going to have to happen. Either you're going to have to listen to the word of God and believe it and obey it so we can walk together, or we're going to have to separate because we're not going in the same direction. We can't walk together if we're not going in the same direction. That just makes sense. How can two walk together except they be agreed? So, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Pardon me just for a moment again. Be, <laughs> be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Okay, that's what we call a rhetorical question. The answer is none. And what communion hath light with darkness? Remember we talked about the word communion? We can't have communion together unless we are common to each other. And what communion hath light with darkness? None. You can't mix light with darkness. It's either one or the other. Period. It's either one or the other. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial is a word that means foolishness, stupidity, doing foolish things. Okay, Going after the gods of the heathen, that's foolish things. And I've done foolish things in my past, and so have you. Okay, if, if we're being honest, we have to admit that. Nobody can say, I've never done anything foolish except maybe the Lord Jesus Christ. I shouldn't say maybe, except for the Lord Jesus Christ. Other than him, nobody can ever say, I've never done anything stupid. Okay, Unless they were just born, and they don't know how to talk at that point, so they can't say that. <laughs> But if you were just born like an hour ago, you might be able to say that you've never done anything stupid. Other than that, if you tell me you've never done anything stupid, you're lying to me. That's just the fact. So we've all done those things. I've been, you know, in my journey with the Lord Jesus Christ, I've been in those churches where there were women standing in the pulpits and I thought it was okay until God showed me it wasn't okay. I've been in those churches where people were doing this and that and the other thing against the Word of God and worshiping Saturn and all that stuff, worshiping Ishtar in the churches, calling upon a spirit that they don't even know the name of, that they called it, um, um, what's the name that they use, uh, that they say means the glory of God. Um, you know, I forgot, Shekinah. Shekinah is a word that they say in the, in the false churches means the glory of God. It's actually the name of a devil. And people worship that devil and they, they call upon the Shekinah glory to come and fill them and all that stuff. And they have no idea what they're talking about. They just do whatever their leaders tell them. And they think that Shekinah is a Hebrew word that means the glory of God. But they've never... And I was told that too. And, and when, after I was told that, I was like, okay, where's that in the Bible? Uh, where is the word Shekinah in the Bible that you know means the glory of God? Is it, you know, when they built the temple and, and, and Solomon, you know, put the, the ark in the temple and... Uh, and, and the glory of God filled the temple? Is that where the word Shekinah is? I, I'd like to find it there. Well, I looked there and it wasn't there. You know, is it in Exodus chapter 40 when they built the tabernacle and, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle? So I looked in Exodus chapter 40 and the word Shekinah wasn't there. See, and the people in the churches today, they don't want to do that. They don't want to seek the Lord and his word. They just believe whatever their teachers tell them. But the word Shekinah, the Hebrew word Shekinah, is not in the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. Um, it's not in the Bible, and it doesn't mean the glory of God. It is the name of a devil. Okay, It is the name of an androgynous uh, slash female deity, uh, which is a fallen angel, and people worship it, and they gather together in their church houses and their fornication centers where they believe that they're Christians, and they have their Hillsong concerts, and they invite this spirit that they only call Holy Spirit because they don't know its name, and they call it Shekinah, and they invite it, to fill them. They beg it to fill them. And guess what? It does. And that's why they're fornication centers. And that's why the, the Bible says the kings of the earth and, 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 and all the peoples of the earth have drunken of the wine of her fornication. 
fornication. Okay, They are fornicating with false gods, and they're calling their gods by names and words from the Bible, thinking that they're worshiping the God of the Bible, but they're not. They're not. And so what communion hath light with darkness? We cannot commune with them because we don't have anything in common with them. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? That's foolishness. To go into a fornication center and to, and to beg a spirit to come into you whose name you do not know. That's foolishness. That is foolishness. That's Belial. Okay, and this is what the scripture talks about, means when it says the sons of Belial. People that are foolish, oafish, stupid. People that have a hard time finding their way home from work at night. People that don't have the common sense to manage their money, to manage their affairs, to avoid uh, certain things, certain pitfalls, to navigate their way through this life with wisdom. Those are the sons of Belial. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Those that walk in darkness are the sons of Belial. They know not what they do. They understand not where they go. And that's, therefore they trip and they stumble and they fall because they don't know how to navigate through this world because they don't have the light in them. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. They are the sons of Belial. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? What concord hath Christ with Belial? These are two extreme opposites. Because Christ has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. But Belial is foolishness and ignorance and perdition. So what concord hath Christ with Belial? None. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Amen. If you are a believer, if you... If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you have obeyed his gospel and you believe his word and you walk in his commandments, then you're a believer. Okay? I know that you know people, church people, love to use that word believer. They don't use the word Christians because that's too confining for them. Um, they just use the word believer. Well, guess what? The devil is a believer too. The devils believe and they tremble. Okay? So not everyone that is a believer is a Christian. But if you're a Christian, then you are a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe his word and you obey his word. And the fact that you obey his word is the evidence of the fact that you believe his word. See, if you don't obey his word, you don't believe his word. Even though you say you believe all day long, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. This is what the scripture says. And this is why theologians absolutely hate the book of James. If all the theologians in the world could get together and vote, they would all vote to take the book of James out of the Bible. And they practically have, but they have not succeeded. But praise the Lord. And what agreement, verse 16, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Okay, this is what people are doing in the fornication centers. They have these idols. The Catholic churches have their crucifixes. The Eastern Orthodox churches have their their icons. They don't call them idols. They call them icons, which is a different word for the same thing. Statues and paintings of dead people. Um, and these are idols. And also, in the Protestant churches, they also have idols. Okay, And I'm not going to go into all, a long list of them, but they also have idols. Okay, They have their leaders that they idolize, their people that they call bishop this and pastor that, and reverend so-and-so. They idolize them. Oh, he's been to seminary. He knows Greek and Hebrew. He knows everything. I don't have to read my Bible. I just go to church and listen to what my pastor says because my pastor preaches straight out of the Bible. My goodness, if I had a dollar for every person over these last 25 years who told me their pastor preaches straight out of the Bible, um, I don't know. I'd have a lot of dollars. Let's just put it that way. Okay, there's a lot of people that say that. And of course your pastor preaches straight out of the Bible. That's his job. You see? But the people that say that don't know the Bible. And they think in their delusion that God has sent unto them because they love unrighteousness and God has turned them over into a strong delusion. They think in their delusion that because their pastor knows the Bible, they don't have to. So they don't read their Bible their, their Bible is open for 30 minutes when they go to church on Sunday, and it's closed all the rest of the week. And they don't know what the Bible says, and therefore it's easy for their lying pastor to lie to them and deceive them. That's what he learned in seminary, to lie to them and deceive them. That's what seminaries teach people, to lie and deceive. And so these people have set up these men as their idols. They worship these men. 
They say, just like Paul said, he was rebuking the, 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 the people in the Corinthian church, how, how that some of them said, I am of Cephas, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Paul, and I am of Christ. And Paul was like, hang on a second. Is Christ divided? Was, was Paul crucified for you? What is Paul and what is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye heard the word. You see, and Paul let the people in the church know, we're all men. Okay, just like me, I'm a man. I've been given my ministry. I've been given my work to do. I'm not exalted above anybody. I'm here to serve you. And I'm accountable to the word of God just like you are. But men in their denominational churches set up other men who have been to seminaries and they give these men special costumes and they stand in a pulpit and put on shows once a week. And the people in these, in these church buildings, in these church organizations, they put their faith in that man. Many people put their faith in, in John MacArthur, just for an example. John MacArthur is a lost and confused man. He is verily a child of hell. He doesn't know who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And he doesn't know how to become a Christian. He's never preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to anybody, but he's a very famous pastor. And when you go to the people that sit under his ministry and you dare to open up the Bible and show them that John MacArthur doesn't know who Jesus Christ is, is preaching a false Jesus and a false gospel, they will attack you up and down. They will attack you all day long and all throughout the week. They will attack you, but they will not hear the word of God. They will not listen to the preaching of the word of God. They will just say, John MacArthur is a man of God. He's a great man of God. And how dare you speak anything against him? He knows Greek and Hebrew. He's been a pastor before, since before you were ever born. When you were in diapers, he was preaching sermons. Well, wait a second. What does that have anything to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? What, what, what the Bible says? How does that change what the Bible says? Well, the answer is it doesn't. You see, these people don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. They have set up an idol and they worship John MacArthur or David Jeremiah or John Hagee or Kenneth Copeland or the Pope of Rome or, you know, Jonathan Kahn or, or you know, I think I said Kenneth Copeland already or, you know, all these other men. It, it doesn't make any difference what, what, what man it is. You know, R.G. Sproul or, or, or uh, Ravi Zacharias who's passed on now and, and he perished. And, you know, all these famous theologians, Hank Hanegraaff, and I could go on and on and on. There's, there's lots of them. There's hundreds of them. And these people set up these idols, and they think that because, in their estimation, this guy knows the Bible, that they don't have to. They think that because they imagine that David Jeremiah knows the Bible, they think that because they imagine that Charles Stanley knows the Bible, that they don't have to, and that they can just go listen to Charles Stanley every Sunday. And they're good to go. Don't, oh, I don't, don't worry about it. I don't need to know the Bible. Charles Stanley knows the Bible. And I'll just go listen to him and see what he says. Don't you know that that's idolatry? They have set up an idol before themselves between them and God. Charles Stanley is leading them to hell. Because he's a Baptist. He's not a Christian. He's a Baptist. He believes in a triune God and a gospel that can't save anybody. He's a very nice guy, I'm sure. I've never met him, but I'm sure he's probably a really nice guy. But he's a minister of Satan. And they've set him up as an idol. They've gone to Charles Stanley and they've stopped there. They don't want to read God's word. They don't want to seek God in his word. They don't want to know God. All they want to know is Charles Stanley's God. They say, Charles Stanley knows all about God. That's good enough for me. Here I am. <laughs> Sit myself in the pulpit, or pardon me, in the pew, and open my Bible and listen to what Charles Stanley's going to say. And then I close my Bible and I go home, and I live like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, act like the world all week until next Sunday when it's time to come, time to, come to church again and sit myself down in the pew, <laughs> probably in the same spot. <laughs> that was kind of funny the way I did that. Sorry. In the same spot <laughs> and listen to the same gobbledygook and drivel and nonsense that he preached like, I don't know, three, three, four weeks ago. How many sermons does Charles Stanley have? Maybe he has like 25 of them and he just kind of rotates. I don't know. Or maybe he has more. I don't know. But anyway, that's the case, that these people have set up these men as idols. And they just stop there. That To them, Charles Stanley, that, that's all they need to know about God. They've stopped right there. See, they don't, they don't seek God. They don't desire to know God. They don't seek Him on their faces and pray. They don't fast and pray. They don't open His Word. They don't ask God questions trying to get answers from God. They just trust Charles Stanley or David Jeremiah or John MacArthur or Andy Stanley or, you know, it, 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 there's, there's 
There's a plethora of these men. These are the idols that these men set up. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? When somebody comes to your Christian, my brother or my sister, and they say, you got to come to my church and hear my pastor. No. No, we, we can't build together because we're not of the same seed. See, praise the Lord. Because it's against the law of God for two seeds to grow together. You see, it's against the law of God to take two threads that are made of two different types of material and weave them into the same fabric and put on that fabric as a garment. And what does a garment do? It covers you. Oh, 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 oh. but I, I'm not going to go there right now. I'm thinking about Isaiah chapter 29. And so are those of you who are in Christ. Praise the Lord. Um, then I want to continue with what I started here. So verse 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Ye are the temple of the living God. You see, Peter wrote about this in Second Peter, how that we are all living stones being built up upon the, our chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. We are living stones built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. See, we are all living stones being built up into a house for, for the name of God. Even as the temple that Solomon built was a house for the name of God, so are we. We are those living stones. I'm a living stone. You're a living stone if you're my brother or my sister. You're baptized in Jesus' name. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. You believe his word and you walk according to his word because his word is in you. You're born of it. We are living stones being built up into, into a spiritual house for God to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are that house. We're not in the house. We don't have to go to the house. We don't have to find the house to go to it. We are it. We are it. We are the house. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Where is that written, boys and girls, brothers and sisters? Yes, I know it's written in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It's written in, in, in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. God said, And I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God our Father, was poured out upon the waiting disciples, and they were filled with power from on high, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then Peter commanded that they should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and that all those who were seeing that which was happening would also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wherefore, verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them. All right. Now, is this the book of good suggestions? Is this Bible, this Holy Bible, is this the book of good suggestions, brothers and sisters? No, it is not. It is the Word of God. It's not up for debate. It's not up for discussion. It's not up to us to take it under advisement and get back to God on whether or not we're going to do what He said. It's either for us to obey and live or disobey and perish. That's it. Okay? It's God's way or the highway. Period. End of story. The Bible says, Wherefore, come out from among them. There are many people, my brethren, there are many people who imagine that in this denomination and in that denomination and in that denomination over there there's some people that are saved they say that there's some people that are saved in the Baptist denomination there are some people that are saved in the Lutheran denomination there are some people that are saved in the Methodist denomination there are some people that are saved in the Pentecostal denomination no that's not what the Bible says the Bible says, come out from among them. See, it doesn't matter. Uh, how should I say this? The fact that you have been saved from your sins by the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you're automatically saved from the wrath of God that is to come. Because the Bible says that we need to endure unto the end. He that endureth unto the end shall be saved that we need to abide in the doctrine of Christ, that we need to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You see, if we don't continue in the faith of Jesus Christ our Lord, then we will perish. If you don't continue in the faith that, that caused you to be baptized in his name, believing that he's risen from the dead, if you don't continue in that, 
and you stop believing that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, well, guess what? You're not going to be risen from the dead. Because the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And so the fact that you may have been saved from your sins, you know, Pentecostals, they believe Acts 2.38. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. But they depart from the Lord at that point. After that point, I should say. And they depart unto other doctrines that are not the doctrine of Christ. And so they don't have God. So the fact that a man in the Pentecostal church may have been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, yeah, that means that he's saved from his sins. That doesn't mean that he's going to enter into the kingdom of God. And if he continues to sit in that Pentecostal church among those people, then he's going to perish with them. Because God has said, come out from among them. Come out from among them. You see? If a man has been saved from his sins and he goes to a Baptist church, yeah, he's been saved from his sins. But if he goes and sits in that Baptist church until he dies, then he's going to perish with them. Because God has said, come out from among them. God has said, come out from among them. And be ye what? Separate. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Okay? What did Zerubbabel and the chief of the fathers of Israel say to the adversaries of Judah and Israel, Judah and Jerusalem, when they came and said, let us build with you? What did they say? They didn't say, oh, okay, let's all just love one another. We, we all believe in God, right? We all believe in God, right? So it's all okay. No, they didn't say that. They said, you all have nothing to do with us. We will build the house alone because we have a covenant with our God and we have his word and we keep his word. See? See? So if you're a Christian and you go and sit with Baptists and die in a Baptist church, guess where you're going to go? You're going to go to hell. My brother or my sister, you're going to wind up in hell. If you're a Christian you go to a Catholic church and sit and die in a Catholic church, if you go to a Lutheran church and have a heart attack and die in a Lutheran church, unless you were in the act of being there for the purpose of preaching the gospel to them, what's going to happen to you when you die? You're going to go to hell. Because you are among the disobedient. God said, come out from among them and be ye separate. You see, you can't take two different threads that are made from two different materials and weave them together into the same garment and then put on that garment to cover yourself. That doesn't work. It doesn't work and God will not accept it. It is an abomination and the abominable shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and, be, and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Listen, and I will be a father unto you Wait a second. This is a letter to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth. We can read about this in the 18th chapter of Acts, how Paul went to them, spent a year and a half with them. He baptized them in the name of the Lord. He spent a year and a half with them teaching about the faith of Jesus Christ. They were raised up in the faith of Jesus Christ. So how is it that Paul prophesies to them by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God says, and I will be a father unto you? Wasn't he already their father? How could he say, and I will be a father unto you? Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You see, my brethren and sisters, it takes more than being baptized in Jesus' name and speaking with other tongues to make you a son of God. The Bible says, that whosoever is led by the Spirit of God, the same as a son of God. Okay, They that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And if you'll come with me over to John chapter 8 real quick. I was speaking about this earlier. Let me just read it to you. Starting in verse 39. No, let's start a little earlier. Starting in verse 34, it says... Jesus answered them, and Jesus, the king of the Jews, is talking to the Jews, the Jews, the children of God, okay? 
He taught these people to say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. Okay, Jesus taught these people, the Jews, that God was their Father because they were of the sons of Abraham, who begat Isaac, who begat Israel, who begat the twelve patriarchs. And that's where all these people came from. So Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, John 8, 34, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the, if the son therefore shall, shall pardon me, if the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, said the Lord, speaking physically. I know that ye are Abraham's seed. I know that ye are the physical descendants of Abraham. That's no mystery. Okay? I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Now he was just setting before them a difference. My father, your father. Two different fathers. And if it makes any difference, in the King James Bible... Jesus' father is with a capital F, and their father is with a lowercase f. Although we don't make doctrine by capital letters or not capital letters, but it just happens to coincide that way. But when he said, I speak that which I have seen with my father, he wasn't talking about the same person as he was talking about when he said, And ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Okay, good point. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Oh, I love, the, I love thy word, Father. I love thy word, Lord Jesus. If ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Jesus said unto them, Pardon me, ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. What were they talking about? We be not born of fornication. They were talking about the Samaritans. They were talking about the, the people of the captivity in Assyria that came down and inhabited the land of Israel and came unto um um, 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 the man that Zerubbabel that came unto Zerubbabel and the chief of the fathers of Israel and said let us build with you and Zerubbabel and the chief of the fathers said no you have nothing to do with us we will build this temple ourselves they said we be not born of fornication they were saying we're not mixed breeds we are the stock of Abraham then said they unto him we be not born of fornication we have one father even God Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God... Heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Jesus was speaking to the church, Israel, the Jews. When I say the church, I'm talking about the congregation of Israel, the Jews, the church as it was in the Old Testament. Jesus was speaking to the Jews. And he told them that God was not their father. 
even though they were related to Abraham. They were the physical seed of Abraham. They were descended from Abraham. And they were living in the land that God promised to Abraham. And they knew the law. But they would not keep the law. Because the law and the prophets testified of the one who was standing before them and they would not hear his word. They could not hear his word. Because they were of their father, the devil. They had a different father. They were of their father, the devil. Come with me back to 2 Corinthians now. Chapter 6. Hallelujah. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Linen, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. And Leviticus 19, 19, neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. Linen was the material that God commanded the people of Israel to make the priest's garments out of. The priest's garments were made of linen, and not just linen, fine linen. Okay, And in the book of the Revelation, chapter 19, thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I thank you for your word. Revelation 19.8, it says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. It is the garment of the priesthood. And if we take the thread that is used to make fine linen and we weave it together with woolen thread that is used to make a woolen garment, we are doing something that is an abomination to the Lord. If we take that fine linen, that thread that is used to make fine linen, which is the righteousness of the saints, and we mix it with that which is representative of those who profess to be Christians but deny the word of God and are not in the doctrine of Christ, they're idolaters, they're sons of Belial, they're unbelievers. That's what the woolen thread is. Okay? And we mix those two things together so that we weave them together. They become woven together. God has commanded us not to do that. And if God has commanded us not to do that, then what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ when that garment is presented before Jesus Christ? It contains the, the thread of the linen. What's Jesus Christ going to do? Is he going to unravel that garment to separate the linen from the woolen? No. No. He's going to destroy it completely. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. The fact that you say that you love God, the fact that you may read your Bible, the fact that you may go to church, the fact that people may consider you to be a Christian, the fact that you may consider yourself to be a Christian, does not mean that God is your father. God is only your father if you are obeying his word. Jesus said, My mother and my brethren are these that hear the words of God and do them. Or rather, these that hear the word of God and do it. That's what Jesus said. See? So we cannot mix linen and woolen together. We cannot mix diverse kinds of seeds together. We cannot yoke an ox and an ass together. 
we must be separate. We must be separate. And that is not that we should be stiff-necked as the Jews and prideful and think that we're better than the rest of the world because we're not. We're not. Huh. Okay, I know, where I, I know what I was. I know where I came from. Okay. <laughs> God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. I'm living proof of that. And you are too, if you're a Christian. So we're not better than anybody, but we are a peculiar people, a people chosen of God, the Israel of God, whom God hath exalted and chosen for himself, a people above all the peoples of the world. By the grace of God, we've been adopted into the royal kingdom of the living God. We are that fine linen by the grace of God, by the grace of God. Should we then take ourselves and make ourselves the members of an harlot? Should we then take ourselves the fine linen that God hath spun and weave ourselves together with woolen thread to make one garment? What is that garment that is made of linen and woolen? What is it? What is it, boys and girls, brothers and sisters? There's one word that describes it. It comes from Rome. What is it? Ecumenism. Ecumenism. Ecumenism is a satanic design to make one garment out of linen and woolen thread. To make one garment to cover ourselves with. And when the day of judgment comes, that garment that we have covered ourselves with will be stripped from us and cast into the fire. See, that's not how we do it, brothers and sisters. That's not how we do it. The way we do it is the way God says to do it. Come out from among them and be separate. And that way, God will be a father unto you. Yeah, you've been baptized in the name of the Lord. Praise God. You've, been, you've received the Holy Ghost. You speak with other tongues. Praise God. Now obey God, and he will be a father unto you. Okay? Don't say like the Jews, we have Abraham for our father. Because John said, you know what? God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. You all need to turn from your evil works and do works meet for repentance. That's what needs to happen. See, we who are Christians, we need to abide in the word of God. We need to be humble and with a broken and contrite heart before God. We need to obey his word. And if there's something that we learn from reading his word that we've not been doing, that we should be doing, then what do we do? We start doing that. And we keep ourselves from that which is evil and that which is wicked. We don't have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We rather reprove them because that which is darkness is made manifest by the light. That's what we're here for, brothers and sisters. We are light. We are salt. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are not here to be mixed together, woven together in the fabric of ecumenism woven together in the demonic Roman fabric of ecumenism to make a garment to cover the whole world with. You know what that garment is? It's strong delusion. Strong delusion, my brothers and sisters. Okay, we have no reason to be prideful, but at the same time, we must keep ourselves pure. We must not intermarry among the Canaanites. And what I mean by that. It's not that God has any problem with, with a man who, of brown skin marrying a woman with, with light-colored skin. What I mean by that is that we need to stop mingling ourselves with people that are pagan and mixing ourselves with them in their religious works and allowing them to infect our lives and our relationship with God with their pagan rituals. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot sit at the table of the Lord and at the table of devils. See, you cannot call yourself a Christian and go to a Pentecostal church or a Baptist church or a Lutheran church or a Catholic church or any church that is a building called a church with a name on the door that is not Jesus Christ. If you do that, then you're not a Christian and God is not your father. 
God is only your father if you do the works of God. Just like Jesus said to the Jews, if you were Abraham's seed, you would do the works of Abraham. So don't think that just because you go to church that you're a Christian and that God is your father. Just because your paid entertainer that you call a pastor said that God is your father, you think that God is your father. But you're married to someone else's wife and you keep the Saturnalia festival and you've got a cigarette hanging out of your mouth and you do this and you do that. I'm not going to get into all kinds of things, but you know what I'm talking about. Okay, Learn not the ways of the heathen. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon thee. Thus saith the Lord. Amen.